Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and uh, I thought I would do this one as a voiceover so that I can throw some of the charts up in the background. Uh, because something that keeps coming up, I've had people in my comments lately uh, keep mentioning pound for pound strength. And it is something you hear quite a bit of on YouTube, and it has to do with certain people putting their own programs and stuff out, giving you goals for pound for pound strength, meaning that they'd like to see you bench press X times amount your body weight and squat X times amount your body weight. Uh, and what people need to remember with this, this is kind of a noob thing and a gimmicky thing because you need to understand relative strength matters. I'm not saying relative strength doesn't matter. All right. And people kind of get that idea that I only say absolute strength matters, but relative strength isn't judged by these ratios because these ratios favor certain types of people. And you're going to be sadly disappointed if you set goals based upon multipliers of your body weight because the funny thing is you might reach these certain points in the first year of your training and then your ratios may not improve very much later on in fact guys might even go on a bunch of gear blast a gram of testosterone a week and two years later barely increase their ratios uh, so there, there's a very very big flaw in the body weight multiplier uh, system when it comes to the strength world and strength and conditioning coaches have known this for decades uh, strength sports have known this for decades uh, because you'll get people who are really new to it who will start saying, oh, well, you know, yeah, I understand that there's absolute strength and there's relative strength. You look at the pound for pound, right? Well, yeah, if you start looking at pound for pound strength, almost every power lifter at Worlds who weighs 220 or more, with some exceptions, doesn't have a good multiplier. <laughs> Like all the heavyweight guys don't have a good multiplier usually, unless they're really short. And they've used tons of drugs to push themselves way up several weight classes higher than they could ever be in. And the world's strongest man competitors, there's guys who've been in the gym for one, the, the gym for one year training hard who have better squat bench ratio, overhead press, everything than some of the guys winning the, the world's strongest man. Do you really think their relative strength is better after only a year or two of training? Of course it isn't. So... Why do these ratios favor certain people? Very simply put, the shorter you are, the easier it's going to be for you to hit a certain multiplier. In other words, if you are five foot four or five foot five, you might actually reach a double body weight bench completely drug free. And you might do it in three to five years. Whereas in men who are taller, if you're say f average height five eight, five nine, or you are over six foot, reaching a double body weight bench is going to be absurdly difficult. And it's gonna be very, very rare for guys who aren't either blasting gear or who haven't been really focusing on their bench for a decade. Do you guys see the problem there? And the, the same thing, uh, a guy who is a couple inches shorter than you is probably, if your training has been similar, uh, your diets have been similar, everything else, he's probably going to have a slightly better ratio than you. It favors shorter people and shorter meaning anywhere that you are. I don't mean, I'm not saying there's a cutoff point. I'm saying that a guy who's six foot one is probably going to have an easier time reaching those ratios than a guy who's uh, six foot four. Three inches difference makes a difference on that. And it has to do with the fact that you've got to move the weight a further distance. So there's another function going on as far as your muscle mass goes. And, and this has been recognized forever in the strength and conditioning world. This is why strength sports use a Wilk score to measure people cross weight class and to measure people in the same weight class. Like they don't use multipliers, they use the Wilk score. And what you'll find is that the Wilk score pretty well is a decent, decent representation of relative strength. But if you come in and a lot of times you'll see guys who do this, they'll be like, oh, yeah, my pound for pound strength is good. And they're in a lighter weight class. And then you go to a meet and then they rank you in the overall. They, they do a cross class ranking. And then you, all of a sudden, a guy who you thought you were stronger than on relative strength, when they plug in their scores cross class, he places eight spots higher than you. Like he crushes you at the meet. You know, the guy in the 220, and let's say you're in the, the 165, and you're thinking, man, I have better multipliers than him. I I'm, I'm, have a better relative strength, but then he still beats you in the overall when they measure it class class. Uh, again, people are going to find it doesn't work that way. Uh, so, and if people don't want to use a Wilkes score or a Wilkes coefficient, what you also have available 
our strength and conditioning charts. And that's what I put up in the background. And these will give you a good idea of where you rank. And what people need to understand, they'll say, say stuff like they'll see those charts and go, but I'm at this body weight. It would take me forever. How am I ever going to add that much weight to get to those other categories, uh, you know, to be in, in that category? It's like, well, you're going to have to gain weight and muscle. You're not going to be in your weight class forever. I mean, realistically speaking, if your goal is to spend you know, the next 10 years getting stronger, do you really think you're going to gain strength for 10 years without gaining a few pounds of muscle mass? So yeah, there's sometimes people look at that and go, it says I've got to put, you know, 80 pounds on my bench press to get from here to here. Yeah. And that's the point guys, advanced, elite, all that stuff. Uh, yeah. It should take you three to five years of very hard, very consistent training to, to reach the advanced chart on there for most people. And here's my point. Do you honestly think that in three to five years of hard, heavy training, you're not going to gain any muscle weight? I mean, do people really think that? And that's why it gets funny when people start looking at those charts. It's like, no, if you're way down on the chart, let's say you're in the, the 165 class and you've, you know, you're, you're only hitting intermediate numbers in the 165, uh, you're probably going to have to bulk to the next weight class over time. If you want to get to the advanced or the elite numbers there, you're probably going to have to gain weight because you're not in the right class as far as weight category for a guy with your muscle, with your frame. You've got to remember, maximum muscular potential has a lot to do with the size of your bone structure. The biggest factor in your bone structure is what? How tall you are. In other words, no matter how wide your collarbone or thick your wrists are or anything else, a guy who's six foot has a bigger frame than a guy who's five six. Right? Is there is there he's got another six inches length of bone to put muscle on? Does anyone really think that if someone has achieved ninety plus percent of their, their maximum muscular potential, even their drug free potential, that those two guys are gonna be in the same weight class? They started out bigger. And the shorter you are, the less total muscle you'll gain. A really short guy, drug-free, might only put on 20 pounds of muscle over the course of his training life. The taller guy, the six foot one guy, might put on, have the potential to put on 30 pounds in his training life. And if he started 50 pounds heavier already, <laughs> that's already going to be an 80 pound difference in their total body weight at the same body fat if they've, they've gotten close to their, their muscular potential. So people need to understand this, this stuff doesn't work. It, it's, it's fine for gimmicky stuff to convince noobs. But when you start really wanting to compare other people, this, this pound for pound thing doesn't work. <clears throat> and it absolutely favors certain people. You know, and these charts also assume, just like any sort of strength sport, that you actually train your entire body. I mean, because uh, some people be like, well, how come, you know, I'm advanced on the bench press? but I'm still, you know, whatever level intermediate, or I'm elite on the bench press, but I'm an intermediate on the squat and deadlift. It's like, well, because you don't train your legs and had you trained your legs, you would be 10 pounds heavier. You'd be 10 pounds heavier. <laughs> and so the reason you're, you're doing really well on just upper body lifts is because you only have an upper body and you don't really have legs. You haven't developed your legs or the rest of the strength in your body. So obviously you're going to skew things, and particularly that, that ratio thing. I mean, if you want to have an amazing ratio, for example, on your bench press, be born short, uh, avoid pulling from the floor, avoid squats, avoid leg presses, avoid too much direct leg work, get as lean as possible, and be short and focus on pressing. You'll have an amazing bench press ratio. <laughs> but if you, that's not going to make you truly strong because you spend spent all your time on only half of your body and you don't have a lower body and no one is really strong unless you're strong top to bottom. So just things that people need to look at when they start looking at this relative strength, but you'll see people who will do programs that way and they'll sell you programs and everything else uh, saying, hey, these are the ratios you need to hit. That's noob stuff, guys. That's stuff to, where you're talking to noobs. Anyone who's been in the iron game a long time knows these ratios don't matter that relative strength is judged by charts. And these strength and conditioning coaches have put these charts together observing athletes for decades and decades. Uh, they're pretty good. They're not perfect, but they're pretty good. The same thing, the Wilk score isn't a perfect representation. You know, it's, it's not perfect. 
but it's pretty good. It will get you in the ballpark to let you know if you, you legitimately are stronger than someone else in terms of relative strength or where you stack up or maybe where you need to improve. So, I mean, this this is the way this is done. These whole idea of strength ratios, uh, this that's kid stuff, it's noob stuff, it's for people who are not educated at all in strength and conditioning and have never been around uh, the, the strength world at all or any sort of coaching. Because if they had been, they would know that stuff doesn't work. It's been known forever. It's been known forever. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.